people when you're ready for Easter. A lot of people in our society are not hardly thinking about Easter, much less doing any real preparation for it. Easter. It's not like Christmas. Piece of news anchors on the TV do not uh, count down how many shopping days until Easter. We don't put up Easter trees or hang Easter wreaths. You know, think Peter Boyle is going to have an Easter wreath making contest. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my Jew, my wife had did does have a friend in Congo. We went to see her a couple, two or three weeks ago, and into her house. She actually has an Easter tree. She has a Christmas tree. Apparently, it keeps up all year. It's an artificial tree, small tree, but it's all decorated with Easter eggs and carrots and bunnies. So she has an Easter tree. Maybe the only one around her has an Easter tree. But the craft people in the village do not get together and uh, and uh, host uh, Easter in the village. You know, many people in our society will not celebrate Easter in any way. Now, families with children may participate in Easter egg hunts, where they might have Easter baskets, but that's probably the extent of it. Easter just isn't very important for many people today. Even many people who would never miss a Christmas Eve service will not come to worship on Easter Sunday morning. Easter just isn't the way it used to be. You, we all remember probably the way it did, used to be. But Easter was a big deal. And people bought new clothing and they wore their very best on Easter Sunday. And all the churches were filled for that one, one morning. But for Christians, Easter still is a big deal. Spiritually speaking, actually, it's the biggest day of the year. It's much more important than Christmas, certainly more important than Thanksgiving or Halloween or New Year's. And so, let me ask you again, are you ready for this most important day of the year? Now, I'm not asking if you have your Easter dinner plans all worked out. I'm asking if you are spiritually prepared for celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Now in this sermon today, I'm going to be looking at the scripture reading for Palm Sunday that I just read for you a moment ago. This took place starting the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, day, the week before Easter. And we're going to see what that has to teach us today about preparing for Easter. First, to prepare for Easter, we need to roll out the green carpet. Now, the green carpet is the first century equivalent of the red carpet, although the red carpet treatment today isn't even what it used to be. It used to be red carpets were reserved for heads of state, you know, kings. Now, red carpets are rolled out for any minor celebrity show, you know, where people will walk the red carpet and they'll pose for photographs of <coughs> their, their new clothing. Red carpet doesn't mean what it used, used to. Back in the first century, the green carpet treatment was, was reserved only for kings and for conquering heroes. And it was green because people cut down palm branches and waved them and placed them in the ro road as a way to honor a person. Our Palm Sunday story says that people also took off their cloaks and placed them in the road. Verse 36. As he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Now that was a real honor. I don't think we really comprehend the significance of this custom. You see, a cloak was an outer garment. It was a coat. It also, for 90% for of the people, served as their blanket at night. Kept them warm at night as well as during the day. And most people only owned one cloak. So imagine today if you only had one coat and you used it for a blanket at night as well. Would you lay it down on a dirt road for a parade of people and animals to walk on? I mean, we, on, on Sandwich Fair, we <laughs> 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 put it out. You know, the roads in Palestine were not the cleanest things in the world, you know, with all those animals. 
you know? This was costly thing to do. This was, was personal, personal sacrifice. <coughs> that means, the meaning for this today, is that to prepare for Easter means that we have to do something to show our love for a Christ in a way that involves some type of sacrifice. Just think about that for a moment. It makes sense because Jesus sacrificed himself for us during Holy Week. He was not only willing to die to sacrifice his life, he did sacrifice his life. And it was not an easy death for him. And he knew it was coming. We could see that with the agony that he had in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Christian life involves self-sacrificial love, giving of ourselves to God and others. Though know, many people think that Christ, the Christian life is just about having religious ideas in our heads, beliefs that we hold, and then religious actions that we do, and then do ethical things, do good things to people, especially be nice to people. But Jesus was talking about laying down one's life for one's friends. He talked about loving God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and, and, and strength. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, that always involves a cost. It involves personal sacrifice. When we move on now to the second way we prepare for Easter. Second, we prepare for Easter by listening to the stones saying, and I'm not talking about Roman stones. <laughs> if you follow the news, you probably know that uh, they canceled their most recent concert. I guess Mick Jagger is in the, at least he was in the hospital. He had some type of heart procedure. But I'm not going to talk about that anyway. My story says that as Jesus was riding down the Mount of Olives on a donkey, his disciples began to celebrate. They sang and they praised God, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The Pharisees, who heard this, didn't like it. They said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I love the scene. Jesus is saying that if the sour-faced Pharisees succeeded in suppressing the joy of the people, that the rocks in the road would break into song. He is saying that the natural world, the creation itself, would start praising God and Christ. Just like the hymn says, this is my father's world, and to my listening ears all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. The whole universe is constantly singing of its creator if we have the ears to hear the stones sing. They tell a story. As many of you know, as I mentioned it before, I started out in college as a geology major. And I don't get to use geology much briefly. <laughs> but once in a while I can, and here I found a place so I can use it. <laughs> I forgot almost everything I learned, you know, so long ago, as an undergraduate in college. One thing that's never left me is the awe I feel at the power that crafts landscapes, around here especially. The glaciers that once covered this area, you know they're a mile high, where we're sitting, the ice is a mile high from where we, where we are. And the massive volcano, that was not very far away, that, that now is the Ossipi Mountains, mega volcano that shaped, shaped the landscape here. The tremendous geologic forces that raised the White Mountains to much higher than they are now, and then eroded them down to where they are. And the huge spans of time that are involved, you know, all the content, you look at a globe and it looks like all the pieces fit together, that's because they do. You know, they were all on one continent at one time, and they slowly came apart. You know how long that takes to do that? It says they are moving, and they're moving now at the rate of, of your fingernails growing. And yet we have the big ocean, the whole Atlantic Ocean that is separated. I mean, think of the power involved here. Isaac Watts wrote in his hymn, I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. Every rock 
tells the story of the power of God that formed the earth from molten magma that pressed them into metamorphic rock that eroded them and laid down a set of mentary layers in ancient seas, preserved fossils of ancient creatures that pushed mountains up and then wore them down over billions of years. Every rock tells their part in that story. That's what the rocks were singing, or would have sang on Palm Sunday. They sang of their creator. And the rocks are just part of it. Every living creature alive today sings its history in its DNA. The stars and the galaxies tell their stories. That just on the news this week about the black hole that we've been able to see for the first time billions of year, um, light years away. It's just amazing. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the sphere. The created order. Nature is the original word of God, pronounced long before there was a Bible. The universe sings of God if we have the ears to hear. Part of what we can do to prepare for the holiness of days coming up in one week is to listen to the word of God in nature, sing its song to, of its creator and its Lord. Third, we prepare for Easter by weeping with Jesus. Jesus came down the Mount of Olives toward the city of Jerusalem, and it says, verse 41, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus goes on to talk about the violence and the destruction that he foresaw would, would happen to Jerusalem in the coming years at the hands of the Romans. Jesus cried on Palm Sunday. The Bible records three times that Jesus wept. He wept at the tomb of his good friend Lazarus, who had died. He wept in the Garden of Gethsemane when he faced the reality of his upcoming suffering and death. And it says that he wept over the city of Jerusalem because it did not know the things that make for peace. And it still does not know the things that make for peace. Jesus wept over the violence in the world. We prepare for Easter by joining Jesus in weeping over the violence in our world today. The mass shootings of innocent people, especially the school shootings, that seem to have no end. Hatred erupting in violence against churches and synagogues and mosques. Wars and rumors of wars too often inspired by ethnic hatred. As we follow Jesus down the Mount of Olives and contemplate the violence in the world and in our nation, it should prompt us to weep with Jesus. You know, Jesus could have chosen any number of different responses to the violence that he saw in his world and saw on the horizon for that holy city. He could have formed a resistance movement. He could have taken up arms against the Romans, but he didn't. He wiped away his tears and he went to the cross. He saw that lasting peace was not a matter of more weapons and stronger armies. He saw the spiritual problem at the heart of the world's violence. Jesus said, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus' solution was to try to open people's eyes to the things that make for peace. Peace within, that is the only permanent solution to wars without. The Apostle Paul writes, For in my soul I delight in God's truth, but I see another reality at work within me, waging war and making me a prisoner of sin at work within me. He goes on and said, What wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Apostle James, who was the brother of Jesus, writes, What causes wars among you? They come from the battle within you. The things that make for peace that Jesus was talking about here are the spiritual things. He cried over a world obsessed with worldly things, but blind to spiritual things. When we open our eyes and see that, then we weep with Jesus. Fourth, 
We prepare for Easter by cleansing the temple. On Palm Sunday, after Jesus wiped away his tears, he continued down the Mount of Olives and immediately entered the temple compound. It says, verse 45, When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. This scene is called the cleansing of the temple. Jesus experienced a wide range of emotions on Palm Sunday, as we've already seen. He went from the joy of the celebration of the procession down the Mount of Olives to sorrow when seeing the city and knowing that these people did not know things that make for, for, for peace. And that sorrow then changed to outrage when he entered the people, entered the temple, and he saw people corrupting his religion. Jesus was so angry, he did something out of character for him. He got violent. He got physical. He overturned the tables, physically drove the money changers, the sellers of the sacrifices, out of the temple courts. It says he made a whip of cords. <coughs> In one gospel, he did do that. Imagine that scene. Jesus was fed up with the corruption in his religion. We prepare for Easter by sharing Jesus' sense of outrage. Being outraged at the corruption in the religion that bears his name today. The clergy sex abuse scandal in the Roman Catholic Church comes immediately to mind. But it is present in other churches as well. It just doesn't get as much press. The same type of sin is being exposed as prevalent now in evangelical churches, most notably the Southern Baptist Convention, which is all of a sudden starting to deal with that and they acknowledge that. It's in the midst of its own sex abuse and sexual assault crisis. And it looks like Baptists are doing the same sort of thing of denial and cover-up as the Catholics did, but it didn't work. For them, it's not going to work for the, for the Baptists either. The Me Too movement has exposed sexual assault by male clergy and evangelical and fundamentalists and megachurches and in mainline Protestant churches. On top of sexual abuse, there is financial misconduct and superstar clergy getting rich off the offerings of people. And these are just a few of the issues facing Christianity today. You could just brainstorm, you'd come up with a, a lot more, such as bigotry and racism and sexism and white supremacy in Christianity. If Christ were to return today, on this Palm Sunday, he would do the same thing as he did then. He would take a whip of cords and he would drive corrupt religious leaders out of their pulpits and out of the churches. We prepare for Easter, therefore, by participating in the same spirit of Jesus, by sharing Jesus' outrage of corruption within religion, within Christianity, not glossing it over, not making excuses for it, or defending those who have committed sins, but doing everything we can to make his church the place he wants it to be. Fifth, we prepare for Easter by sitting at the feet of Jesus. Our scripture passage ends with these words in verse 47. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. And yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Our Palm Sunday passage immediately takes us beyond Palm Sunday to what he did the rest of the week. You know, during Holy Week in church, we normally jump right from Palm Sunday, we jump right into Monday Thursday, and on to Good Friday, and, and on to Easter. But, but during Holy Week, there's also a Monday, and a Tuesday, and a Wednesday. What was Jesus doing on those days before Easter? It says, every day he was teaching at the temple. You see, Jesus did not give up on temple religion. After he drove the money changers out of the temple on Palm Sunday, he returned to the same temple courts the next day and the next day and the next day, daily. I think he did it partly to make sure the money changers didn't come back again. <laughs> he also did it, we're told here, to teach the people. 
to teach the people the right way to worship God and to follow the ways of God. Jesus spent the last few days of his earthly life teaching. We are told the religious leaders were furious at what he was teaching, but they couldn't do anything about it because there were so many people surrounding him and listening to him. We prepare for Easter by listening to Jesus. Don't let this today be the last time that you open the Bible and listen to the words of the Bible before Easter. Take this week to read what he taught during that holy week, those last few days of his life. It's easy enough to find it. We just keep reading in the Gospel beyond what I read for you at the end of chapter 19. Read on to chapter 20 and 21 and 20, 22. Read for yourself what Jesus chose to teach, knowing that he only had a few days to, to, to live. Get that Bible off your book, bookshelf and open it up and read the next couple of chapters for yourself and then ask yourself, why did Jesus choose to talk about these things? We prepare for Easter by listening to Jesus. So those are five ways that we prepare for Easter. We roll out the green carpet, we listen to the stones sing, we weep with Jesus, we cleanse the temple, and we sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. Do these spiritual preparations along with the planning of our Easter dinner? And then make sure that you come to worship next Sunday, on Easter Sunday, to worship God. I personally am going to be in Pittsburgh. Uh, and I are going, to, I'm going out visiting my, my daughter and her family. We're, we're going to be with them next Sunday at the church I pastor out there in the, in the Pittsburgh area, so I'm looking forward to that. I hope you have a joyful Easter here in Sandwich. Since I won't be with you, I'm going to end by wishing you a happy Easter. <laughs> Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this glorious time of the year. All the rest of the year leads up to this, up to this week, this day, this coming day, this Sunday, next Sunday. Lord, prepare us. Don't let these days just kind of be ordinary days and us come upon Easter Sunday and say, oh, it's here. No, Lord, bring us often to you in prayer. Bring us often to read what you did during these days. Bring us often to remember events leading up to your arrest, your death, your resurrection on Easter Sunday. And Lord, make us truly grateful. We pray this in your name.